So today I get to preach on this carol, which is not at first glance a profound or deeply theological carol, as others that we studied up to this point. We've studied two carols by Charles Wesley, and we all know that he was one of the most prolific and one of the most beloved songwriters of all time. He wrote over 6,500 hymns. So including the hymns that we studied last week and the week before, which was Come Thou Long Expected Jesus and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Reuben Faria preached on the latter and my wife Marta, who's translating today, he preached on the former. By the way, what I'm gonna be preaching today, you'll see from the words, it's gonna be really hard for the Portuguese translation. So I think you need to also recognize Marta because she's gonna need that, okay? She's gonna need all the help she can get. <laughs> You see, then after, after the two by Wesley, I preached on What Child Is This that was written by William Chatterton Dix. And this guy wrote over 200 hymns, including 40 Christmas carols. So you may be wondering why I would stray away from these well-known beloved hymn writers to today focus on a song that is not written by a renowned writer and that has a title called God rest ye merry gentlemen. Well, as you will discover today, the title is very misleading because this just happens to be a, a, a hymn, a carol with a very um, classical lyrics and a very catchy tune, but it happens to be one of the most profoundly theological carols in the entire repertoire. It also happens to be one of the oldest carols known to date. So I hope I've piqued your curiosity. And with that, let's dive into stanza one and stanza two and study this carol. So, stanza one. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. In Bethlehem in Israel, this blessed babe was born and laid within a manger upon this blessed morn, the which his mother Mary did nothing take in scorn. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. With that, let's dive into to the story of this song. Now, I wish I could tell you who wrote the song. I wish I could tell you where they wrote it and why they wrote it and so much history behind the song. But anything you hear from anyone is just pure speculation because nobody knows for sure where this hymn came from. What we do know is that it's one of the oldest hymns that we have in our repertoire, dating back to the 16th century. The famous Charles Dickens made mention of this song in his classic story of 1843, A Christmas Carol. It is also known in parts of the world by this title, Tidings of Comfort and Joy. And the earliest known edition, the printed edition of this carol, was a broadsheet that dates back to 1760. Besides the famous mention by Charles Dickens, we also know that it was the second movement to the 1927 carol symphony by Victor Heli Hutchinson. And that's it. There's not much more we can tell you about the song. You can research it and you won't come up with much. But here's what I can tell you for sure, that this song is filled with profound and beautiful truth. So let's go to the word of God and let's see what the biblical connection is. So the carol begins by telling us these words. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. And I think that's excellent advice for those merry gentlemen back there. I think that's still excellent advice for all of us living today. No matter what's going on in the world right now, no matter how bent out of shape everything seems, no matter that the world seems to be falling apart, the challenge is do not be dismayed, do not be anxious, do not be worried, do not be overwhelmed. Let nothing trouble your hearts. The hymn writer is hinting that he's about to tell us 
some very good news as to why we should not be dismayed. And if you remember, when Jesus met with his own merry gentleman, with his disciples, in John 14, 1, he told them, let not your hearts be troubled. And God is saying to all of us today, as we close out what is perhaps one of the most troubling years of recent memory, God is saying to us very clearly, every one of us, Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so why should we be merry? Why should we be rested? Why should we not be let down? Because my friends, you and I have a faith, you and I have a hope, you and I have a belief unlike anybody else on earth. Nobody shares what we share. And we believers, we, we tend to forget what we have. And that's why we become anxious and that's why we become unraveled and that's why we fall apart even as the world falls apart. And so the next line of the carol is important because the next line says, remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. The anointed one, the long-awaited Messiah, the deliverer of the world, the Savior was born on Christmas Day. Now, of course, we don't know if he was literally born on December the 25th as tradition has stipulated and as we all celebrate, but it doesn't matter if it was on the 25th or any other day. What matters is that there was a day in history when Jesus Christ came, he was born, and we got to experience the Savior of the world. And Isaiah, who lived 600 years before his advent, said these words, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Amen? Whose shoulders? His shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. Can you say, wow, with conviction now? Wow. That's one of those verses you all should go, wow, because that's simply an amazing verse. And my prayer is that Prince of Peace may reign in your hearts and in your homes this Christmas. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And then this carol becomes richer and richer with every passing line. Listen to the next line. It says, to save us all from Satan's power when we had gone astray. Jesus Christ came to set us free from the devil's power because all of us, my dear friends, had gone astray. Now, you can't be more biblical or more blatantly theological than that. You see, I know many preachers today who shy away from preaching about hell, about the devil, about judgment, but whoever wrote this song didn't pull any punches. Whoever wrote this song let you know it in your face, this is what Jesus Christ came to do. Amen? This song is, is, is the gospel, it's the good news in a carol. Isn't that amazing? And the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. All have sinned. Every single one of you. Look at your neighbor and tell him you've sinned. Okay, some of you are hesitant to do that. Okay? You can say it easily because it's true. And they can look right back and say, you too. Right? We've all sinned. That's the bad news. But what's the good news? Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. There's a gift, the gift of salvation that's available to every single one of us. Amen? And, and how do you receive that gift? How do you get this wonderful gift? Well, the same writer to the Romans tells us in Romans 10, 9, and 10, he says, so clearly if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe unto righteousness and with the mouth that you make confession unto salvation. So that's how you can get that amazing gift of salvation. Amen? This gift, unlike many people in our country think, and many people in very pious, religious countries think, some people think you can work for it. 
Other people think you can earn it. Other people think you perhaps can inherit it from your parents or from your country. But no, that's not true at all. You see, this free gift of salvation is a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, and so that no one can boast. Right? It doesn't come from you. It's a gift of God. That's how you get it. So salvation, my friends, is the work of God start to finish. And that's what the writer of this carol wants us to know, that Jesus Christ came to set all of us free because all of us had gone astray. And 1 John 3, 8 tells us the reason, listen to this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came. So I hope you're beginning to grasp how incredibly beautiful the words of this song are. How profound is the message. And may God give us all rest. May God give us all peace because if you're a son of God, if you're a daughter of God, this should hold you strong. And that's why the next line says, O tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. That word for some of you might not recognize that word. The word tidings is an old English word for information or news. That's all it is. So it's another way of saying, I'm bringing you good news of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. So my dear friends, for those of you traveling or for those of you staying, as you gather around your fireplace, how many of you are blessed to have a fireplace? I love fireplaces, I wish I had a fireplace. But I've got an electrical (laughs) stove heater thing, okay? It's just not the same, it doesn't crackle, it doesn't, it's not just not the same. So if you do have that fireplace, but if you do have that electrical stove and in the warmth and coziness of your house, as you gather with family and friends, as children or grandchildren come over, may, may your home be a home where the Prince of Peace, where the God of all comfort and joy brings you comfort and joy this Christmas. Why? Because you know that the work of the devil has been broken over your life and you are free indeed. In the second stanza, the writer keeps affirming news about Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy. Then he says these words, in Bethlehem in Israel, this blessed babe was born. And and that's just telling us what Micah had prophesied hundreds of years before Christ came to earth as well. Micah had said, but you Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among all the clans of Judah, Out of you will come the one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. This is not just a babe born in a manger. This is a babe whose origins are of old, from ancient times. This is a babe who who was called the everlasting father, the mighty God. That's who he is. He predates that manger. He's God eternal and at the fullness of time, God the Father sent his only begotten son into the world. And we read then this this beautiful line. Laid within the manger upon this blessed morn, the which his mother Mary did nothing take in scorn. And, And for most people, the song ends there. Because if you hear the song on the radio or if you hear the song in a mall, I've heard the song in the UAE. It's a Muslim country, but they play carols in the malls. I always figured, what was going on there? There's a carol, okay? But um, I just love when I hear these carols in the malls, but normally they only sing two or three at most of seven stanzas. There's seven stanzas in this hymn, and I'd like to call up our youth because they're going to come and read for you the stanzas that we're not going to unpack today. There's too many for me to unpack, but I'm going to unpack just the last one. So they will read for you the stanzas, and then you'll get to listen to the beauty and richness of the song. Maybe at home, you can then unpack it later, okay? But give our youth a round of applause. Come on up, guys. Sorry about this scary youth right here, okay? That's a grim mask. (laughs) Okay, we're going to listen to each of the stanzas. Listen to the beauty of these words. From God, our Heavenly Father, 
a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born, the Son of God by name, O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Then, one, two. Fear not then, said the angel, let nothing you affright. The day is born a savior of a pure virgin bright. To free all those who trust in him from Satan's power and might, O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. The shepherds at those tidings rejoiced much in mind and left their flocks of feeding in tempest, storm, and wind and went to Bethlehem straight away, the Son of God to find, O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. And when they came to Bethlehem, where our dear Savior lay, they found him in a manger where oxen feed on hay. His mother Mary kneeling down unto the Lord did pray, O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place, and with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. This holy tide of Christmas, all other doth the face, O oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Thank you. Hey, Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just going to stay on the last stanza. I'm going to end this with the last stanza. The writer now tells us that there is no other appropriate response. There is no other reply once you've heard all he's just said. He says, now you only have one reply. And he says, now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place. Amen? And, and what a beautiful line that is. In light of all you've just heard, in light of this amazing thing I've just told you, all of you, your only response is to do what David did. And what did David do? I'll tell you what David did. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And how many of you have breath right now? Lift your hands up. There's a few dead. Okay. But all of you that have breath, let's say it together. Praise the Lord. That's the only response we can have is praise the Lord. And then he goes on to say, listen to this powerful line. He says this, and with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. And I think that so often, in our churches, this true love and brotherhood is strangely missing. Can I hear an ouch? Yeah. So many times in our churches, this true love and brotherhood is strangely missing. I love our church because our church is made up of people of all nations, all nationalities, and we gather, and what gathers us together is the name of Jesus, but it's this true love and brotherhood that unites us. And may that true love and brotherhood remain among us. I'm not talking about love as the world has. It, people in the world know how to love. But we're talking about true love. And true love, only you and I that know Jesus have it. Because true love is called agape love. And agape love, love is from God, it's of God, and it's poured out on God's children. Amen? Because every human being is capable of love. They're not capable of agape love. And, and, and you know, folks, this coronavirus, it's the polar opposite of everything we're reading. It's the polar opposite. This coronavirus is telling us we should be apart. This coronavirus is telling us we need social distancing. We need to wear masks so we don't see each other's smiling faces. It tells us we should be separated from each other. When in truth, we are people of embrace. That's who we are. Did you know that in the Bible, there are 59 one another passages? 59, that's just under 60 expressions telling us how we need to act and behave towards one another. Not only towards Jesus, but towards one another. Because in truth, folks, you can't tell Jesus how you love him so deeply when you don't love your brother, when you don't love your sister. How is that even possible? Amen? 
And so there's all kinds of behaviors that the Bible talks about, and it says that it's an overflow of your relationship with Jesus. The more you go intimate with Jesus, the more you love Jesus, the more you're going to love other people. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. And that's why we do things like we do with the, co the concert. That's why we make these hampers. Because our hearts go out to those who have less than us. And the love of God shed abroad in our hearts makes us want to help and love one another. Amen? You know, there's a, there's a guy called Andy Stanley. He wrote these words. The primary activity of the church was one anothering one another. Isn't that an awesome statement? Amen? So as Christmas is upon us, and as you and I gather friends and family in our home, I know that we have been handed down very strict regulations by our government. I know that we've been limited in the way we can interpersonally interact with other people. We've been told now at Christmas to reduce the number of people in our gatherings. My house has always been a house with many people at Christmas. Well, we've been told to reduce that. We've been told to maintain social distance even in our homes. We've been told to wear masks in our homes at the Christmas meal. We've been told to put alcohol on our hands. I don't know about you, but my skin has all but fallen off from all of this alcoholic skin I now have. Now, folks, I know we're living in really, really weird times. We are. But let us all be good citizens. Let's obey the law of the land. Let's do our utmost to keep one another safe in this time. But may I encourage you, may I challenge you, may I appeal unto you, don't let any of these measures rob you of your heart. Can I hear an amen? amen. Don't become cold and indifferent. Don't become an island unto yourself. Don't become a person of the internet. And now your whole focus is the internet and your room and you've lost contact with other people. Don't allow this present evil to rob the warmth of God within your heart. Amen? Amen. You can still, despite all these regulations, you can still be kind. You can still be compassionate. You can still be caring. You can still be loving and you can still be giving. Can I hear an amen? amen. So let's be that way. And remember this, my dear friends, this too shall pass. Coronavirus will pass. And how are you going to come out on the other side? I hope you come out as a person who's been tested and refined through the fire and you become even better. Amen. And finally, I want to end with this line, leaving you to go home and study every other line. Okay? The last line that I want to focus on is this one. This holy tide of Christmas all others doth the face. I love that line. In other words, he's saying this tide, this news, this information I've just told you about Christmas, it makes every other message seem small and insignificant. This message supersedes every message you've ever heard. Listen, every religion on the planet, every philosophy on the planet, every book on the planet, every... Um, Thought, idea, conversation, dialogue, story, everything pales in comparison to this story. There is no story on earth quite like it. It is unique among all the stories ever told in any place, anywhere. The story of God in Christ. The story of God so loving the world that he sends his son into the earth to save you and to save me. There's no other comparison it's an amazing story. And I remember the day that story became real for me when he came and rescued me. And I'm sure you can in your mind remember the day he came to rescue you. It's a beautiful story. It's a powerful story. It's an amazing story. It's a transformative story. And you sitting here today, you're a beneficiary of this beautiful story that no comparison in all the earth. So I'd like you to stand with me and we're gonna close our service off close this message off by saying the story together, okay? Let's say it together. Santa, you should say it very loud because you say it a lot. Are you ready? Okay, let's say it together. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Isn't that amazing news? Think about it. Any story you've ever read, does anything compare to that? Nothing in all the world, my friend. Amen. So I'd like to invite the band comes, and as the band comes, I'd like you all to please bow your heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the writer of this carol. We don't know who he was or who she was. All we know that as this carol has been transmitted down the ages and it's arrived in our time and is still being sung around the world. And Father, wherever this carol is sung, whether it's in a shopping mall in Dubai or in a big um, mall in the United States or in South Africa, wherever the song is played, I pray that the words of the song will fall like seeds onto the souls of the hearts of men and women who hear it, and may they change lives. We thank you for the gospel in a carol, a beautiful song that so deeply touches our hearts. We thank you for inspiring the person that wrote it, and I pray that all of us will leave this place determined to keep on making music to God in our hearts, to keep on speaking words of tidings to the Lord of the wonders you have done in each of our lives. God, you've been good to us. You've been awesome. We love you because you rescued us, because we had gone astray, but you came for us. You saved us. You gave us a new life. And as we enter the Christmas season, I pray that these tidings of comfort and joy will fill the homes and the hearts of every one of my brothers and sisters at Riverside International Church, not only here in Kashkaish, but in Lisbon or the Valles, Albufeira, Coimbra, and Porto. And indeed, that it will fill the church of Jesus Christ in Portugal and around the world. And may we Christians know that even in these dark, dark times, we can still continue to be loving, kind, and compassionate because we are people of true love. This I pray in your precious name. <laughs>